want to welcome everyone today and uh, we've started the recording I want to welcome you to our August pecan topics meeting we have um, some some guest speakers today we've got uh, Jake Luntz from Texas and then we've got Sala Taglevan he'll be joining us in a little bit to talk about um, to talk about irrigation management. So that, uh, that will be a helpful topic at this time of the season for sure. I'll go ahead and start by sharing my screen and get started um, a little bit about what's going on this time of the season. Let's see if I can get everything to work today. All right, Donna, can you see that all right? That's good. Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. So our calendar for pecan growers is our fact sheet that um, we've been kind of going along all through the, the season. And um, so a few things listed for August timeframe are continuing those insect monitoring for uh, things like be ready for shuckworm um, sprays and uh, watch for any type of web worms or other twig girdlers or things. A lot of the time we don't actually do a, a control on that type of insect unless it's really severe. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, a few things we're seeing in the orchard. Um, one thing that's that's pretty timely right now, especially in our area, is crop load management. And so if you live down south uh, in Texas or, or southern part of the state, it might be a little bit late this season. But, um, but normally late July, early part of August is when we look at crop load thinning. And that's one of, gonna be one of our main topics today. Uh, another thing is uh, disease control. And with the scab pressure that we've had this year with all the uh, right conditions with uh, warm temperatures and lots of humidity and heavy dews and rainfall, we're seeing quite a bit of scab uh, showing up on the shucks and, and the leaves this season. And we're gonna talk about irrigation, how we need to be managing that irrigation, especially this time so we can get good quality pecans uh, because this is the time of the season when it's, it's critical to get that water to the pecans so they'll fill out properly. And then if you're thinking about doing cover crops this year, you might be looking at getting your soil prepared for that. Um, also think about removing your cattle so that manure can break down before harvest time. And then make sure that your, your market is uh, lined up so you'll have a place to go with those pecans that everybody's gonna be harvesting soon. So I wanna just stress how important it is to know where your pecans are on the development um, stage. So we do um, a lot of pecan cutting this time of the season. And anybody that's a pecan girl usually has yellow or brown fingers at this time of the year because cutting it open and that liquid, the, the water stage, the liquid in sperm in those nuts, it stains your fingers or your clothes or whatever else. But it's a good way so we can determine what stage those pecans are at. Can't really tell by the outside, so we have to cut them open. And it's important to look at the, the stem in where it's attached to, the, to the, the tree and look for this oval attachment area. Now, we want to cut through the, the small end, the short end, so go across the football, not, diet, not lengthwise across the football, cut it in half this way. So cut that nut in half and you should expose the inside of that, that nut. And so we're looking at this, this stage, how much it's expanded in, in that pecan. And I'll show you a little bit of a, a picture in just a minute. Now, if you cut it the other way, the long ways across that oval, we'll get something that looks like this. So you'll expose that, that middle, the septum part, and we can't actually see the kernel like this. So that's not gonna tell us the right way. So if you cut it that way, just drop it, get another one and cut it the other direction. And when we cut them in half, it's not as useful right now, but it's a good way to look at how they're filling later in the season. So that's, that's a way that we're gonna look um, maybe for shell hardening or for uh, nut fill later. 
So when we cut them open to expose that, that ovule or the kernel, what are we actually looking for? So we've got um, this inside of the pecan, you can see the, the, this outside, it'll start to look a little bit brown and that will be where our shell is starting to harden. You can start to see some browning. But we've got our shuck and our shell. This is gonna be the, the embryo or the ovule and it's filled with water at this stage. That's liquid end sperm that's gonna eventually turn into our, our kernel. And so you can see the middle, the septum right here and all this outer uh, material is, is the packing material. And as that kernel develops, it packs that material tighter and fills up that space, or hopefully it does if we have enough water and nutrients to fill those kernels out properly. So this, this nut, it's out about maybe about 75% expanded. So we're looking for this area. This is kind of the seed coat, the ovule. We want to see it expand it all the way down as far as it can. Now you'd think this was the stem end, but it's actually the bloom end. So they they um, fill from the bloom end towards the stem, a little bit different than what you would assume normally. And so here's another one that's a little bit further behind, not as advanced, and you can see that ovule is not expanded out, maybe about, maybe about 25 percent or so. So it's got a long ways before it starts to get to the end. Now when we're looking at crop load thinning, we want to thin them when they're between that 25 and about 75 percent of that ovule expansion. And if we try to do it too early, the pecans may not have enough liquid or enough mass, enough weight to actually shake off the tree properly. If we let them get too far advanced where they're in the gel or the dough stage, then we lose a little bit of the, the benefits to doing that crop load thinning. So we wanna do it between 25 and about 75% expansion. So here we see that we're at the water stage and from the water stage, they move to the gel stage. When you cut them open, you can see it looks like jelly inside. And this stage usually doesn't last very long, but um, at this stage, there's some things happening. It's a little bit different. And so we'll need to know uh, when we hit that stage to make some of our management decisions. And then when it gets to this stage, that's considered the dough stage. So the kernel is actually filling and developing inside. So why is it important to know what stage our pecans are at? Well, like I said, we, went, we want to know because it helps us to know what time of the season we need to do that crop load thinning. And sometimes we can be, um, you know, earlier or later than normal, but we won't know that unless we're cutting them open to, to see. And so, like I said, we want to thin them at 25 to 75% expansion. And when we get to shell hardening, we know at that stage, our sizing is, is actually completed. They're not going to get any, any larger size-wise when that shell starts to harden. And then when they reach the dough stage, that's when it's really important to turn that irrigation on, make sure that we get lots of water to get that nut completely filled. It's very important for quality. So um, we also, let's go ahead and move for me there. We also need to make some pest de decisions based on pecan development stages. When we look at, at weevil down here on the, the bottom, the adult weevil, we know that when they reach the gel stage, those weevil can actually be depositing eggs inside those, those nuts. Before that, if it's in the liquid stage, when they feed on those nuts, they'll drop to the ground. But once they go to the gel and the dough stage, then they can start laying eggs inside. And we don't wanna see that happen. We wanna to get to them before that. Also on scab, um, when the shell is hard, then we know that scab is, is normally more of a cosmetic issue. It's not gonna affect the size or other things. So it's not as important to, uh, to do our scab control measures after that shell is hard. And then also at shell hardening, it's a good time to do our hickory shuckworm sprays. And up the, at the top, it shows where there's been a, a shuckworm 
uh, feeding on this shuck. And that'll cause some damage to the nuts. The, the shucks may not open properly. So we wanna look at, uh, if you have a history of hickory shuckworm, you may want to be sure and, and spray at that shell hardening time. So it's important to know where, where your pecans are um, at what stage. So if we look at the, the pecans at Perkins at the Cimarron Valley Research Station, this is a Kansa. And you can see in, on July 21st, this is the stage, this is July 28th, and then this was yesterday on August 5th. And so you can look at the development. I like to do these at least once a week. And then I've been posting pictures to the pecan Facebook page, just so people can have an idea of, of how quickly they do advance. Sometimes it's a little slower, sometimes it's very quickly. So it just depends on those weather conditions and the growth of those trees. But you can see, you know, just a few weeks ago, they were maybe about 50%. And then right now, this Kansa looks like it's almost fully expanded. And uh, we're not having to do much crop load management on our Kansas trees because we lost so many limbs to the ice storm. But the one, the limbs that do remain, they also have uh, nuts on those trees. So if we look at Pawnee, um, sometimes it lags just a little bit behind and then it zooms past Kansa and it ripens quicker. So it's kind of, kind of a lag phase, but um, sometimes we end up having to harvest sooner than the, the Kansa, which is a little bit different. But you can see the, the stage of the de development, there may be at a um, 75, 80% expansion on those, um, but, but you can see there's a little bit of difference. This is Merrimack, and we normally consider it more of a mid-season ripening, and um, it's a little bit further behind. And so you can see that, um, you know, full liquid and, um, and expanded, it's a little bit strange that one side is expanding quicker than the other, but uh, that's just the way it's, it's working at this time. And then Peruk is our most, uh, the most early ripening of all our cultivars at Perkins. Um, and so it is 100% expanded. It's still in the liquid water stage. So we have it switched over to gel, but if you're not careful, those really early ripening pecans like Peruk can get weevil damage because you're looking at other varieties and not uh, looking at the Peruk to, to do your sprays. So you need to keep an eye on those early ripening because they're gonna get the weevil damage the quickest. And then here's just a picture of, of clusters in the orchard uh, that I took yesterday. And our cans are really pretty. The nuts uh, are, are really looking nice. Our Pawnee are sizing really nicely. And we've got just a little bit of scab. You can see a few lesions on some of the, the shucks, not a lot. Our Merrimack, this is actually one of the cleaner clusters. Some of them are pretty, pretty rough looking. Uh, we have quite a bit of scab development on those Merrimacks. And then our Peruk is, um, is it's usually not as pretty um, of a shuck, but, but they're doing fine and developing really nicely as well. We have a good, good crop on everything overall. Um, even those trees that have just a couple of limbs left after the ice damage, they're um, gonna have a lot of pecans. Now, if, if we look at some of the things that are going on at the research station at Perkins, um, I did notice a little bit of powdery mildew on some of our cans of nuts yesterday. I didn't see very many, but I did find a cluster that had, uh, had a little bit of powdery mildew, not something we usually worry about too much. Uh, it's not gonna affect quality really that much, especially late season. I did notice a few little yellow lesions on the interior of some of our Peruk, and those indicate that we've had some black aphids. And so it doesn't take very many to cause some damage. Uh, if you see some yellowing on the interior of the tree, if it's kind of compartmentalized little um, areas, uh, look for black aphids on the underneath or on the top of that, that yellow area. If it's overall, uh, the leaf is yellowing, it may be stressed due to water, uh, not enough or too much. And so it's losing some of those interior leaves. In an area that we don't manage around the orchard, we did have a lot of bagworms. And so um, they're never sprayed in that area and it's just been a perfect a storm for bagworms this year. And so this one is actually closed at the top and attached to that chute. 
and that indicates that it's not feeding anymore. Now, if they're open and you can still see that the head of the larva, the female never leave those bags. If you can still see them, then they're still actively feeding. But the ideal time to control bagworms is late May, early June. And it coincides really good with our with our uh, pecan nut case bear spray time. But if, uh, if the people have not sprayed for pecan nut case bear the last couple of years, uh, they may be having some issues with webworm and bag, bagworms as well. They're putting down, uh, uh, continuing with their, with their herbicide applications at the station. Here's a picture of some of our Merrimex with a little bit of scab. And then I'm seeing some leaf curl on some of our our trees and I, it looks like herbicide injury. So I really haven't determined exactly how that happened, uh, but we know some of our phenoxy herbicides can travel for miles on wind currents. But I'm seeing a little bit, I'm not sure if it's self-induced with something or if it's a, a drift issue that we're seeing. So this is kind of unfortunate. Um, we think of scab resistant varieties um, a lot of the time is they never will get scab. So things like Kansa that we normally think are very scab resistant, does that really equal immunity to scab? It really doesn't. And unfortunately, we've had a couple of, of, um, of Kansa submissions to our uh, pecan insect and disease laboratory that have shown up with, with pecan scab. And it's not just a visual observation, they've actually cultured it out and found out that it is pecan scab uh, for sure. So that's not something we want to hear. We want our pecan, our, our Kansas to be resistant, but unfortunately uh, we're seeing some, some scab development on some of our, our Kansas. And so if you look at overall, I pulled this map up today. If you look at the overall state for scab hours, and that indicates uh, the right conditions for scab development. And we know that highly susceptible varieties like Western and Wichita squirrel may only need about 10 hours of scab uh, infection hours to initiate some, some problems. 20 hours on those moderately susceptible, and then about 30 hours on our natives and what we consider resistant varieties. And you can see we have had a lot of hours, even in the drier parts of the state, even up in, in the, the northwestern area, we've had a lot of scab hours. So I'm afraid that some of our growers are going to have some scab that they don't realize that is there until they, they get out to harvest. They're going to see some issues with scab. So, um, so we can use this advisory map to know when we want to make those scab applications, those fungicide applications to help prevent scab development. I wanted to announce we are having a fall field day for the Oklahoma Pecan Growers Association, It'll be September 23rd uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. And then we'll have a, a dinner afterwards. It's going to be at Bryant's Pecan Company uh, in Francis, Oklahoma, which is just kind of north of Ada. So if, you, if you're interested in attending, make sure that you email myself or Cheyenne. Uh, with the Oklahoma Pecan Growers Association and let them know that you're coming. It's a free field day. Uh, we just kind of need to know the numbers so we can plan for, for the dinner. But that'll be a fun, a fun time to get together and see the, the Bryant's Orchard. I want to mention our last few um, monthly Zooms for the year. September 10th, October 8th, and November 5th are the, the last three for this year. And so uh, just put those on your calendar. Know that you need to register each month for those events. All right. Any questions about any of the topics that I, that I talked about um, in that presentation? Have anything you want to ask a question about? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. All right, well, you can always join, add that in a little bit later. All right, for our, our next guest speaker, uh, I wanna welcome Jake Muntz, and he is um, 
from Munt's Pecan Company in uh, Charlie, Texas. And so I've known the, the Munt's family for several years. We've done a lot of research on their place. They've been always gracious to let us do some studies there. Um, they have the Pecan Shed, which um, is in Wichita Falls. And I think they have a second location in um, Henrietta, Texas. And so um, they're great family. It's a family operation. Um, I, I think, do, do you have around 800 acres or so, Jake, or is that a little bit different than, is that? Yeah, right? we've got about 800 acres uh, in production right now. We've got about another 900 acres. Okay. So um, Jake's going to talk to us a little bit about some of his experiences with uh, crop load management. And so we've, um, we've done a lot of research on your place, looking everything from nitrates to, um, to I can't even remember some of the studies. We've had several uh, down there, but I remember taking probably a million leaf samples at your, your farm. But it's always a, a, a beautiful location. I've always been impressed with, with how you manage and, and try new things. And that's always, um, want to be on the cutting edge of, of things. But it's a family operation. His dad, Tim, is actually, I think he planted the orchard in, was it 1987? Is that yep. correct? So, right. um, so it's, it's a family operation and, and it's really, I'm excited to have Jake here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, talk something I know a little bit about. At least I have some experience with it. I'm not I'm definitely not an expert on crop thinning. So uh, take all my advice with a grain of salt, try it at your farm, try something different, try something nobody's thought of. Um, we've been crop thinning for probably around 20 years. As soon as the, the our, our first colonies were big enough to have big crops, actually overcrop. Um, we worked with Noble Foundation. Of course, we had Mike Smith from Oklahoma State down when we started doing all the crop thinning. Um, we've learned a lot about it over the years. Um, the thing we, we we really try to stress with the we grow is quality. So crop thinning is always going to help that for us. Um, we've never thinned a crop thinking and got to harvest and thought, oh, well, I wish we hadn't thinned as much off of these trees. It's always start looking at samples, we start selling nuts, it's always, you know, we should have, should have thinned them a little harder. Um, we, should, we should have been a little earlier. Um, we, we should have done, done more than we did. Um, we've got into that situation this year. I've got one farm. I had a real big crop in 19. Um, we didn't thin it. So uh, 20 crop was, was terrible. Then we had a freeze on top of it at that farm. So it was pretty much a zero last year, but it had a really good growing season. We've had exceptional weather for uh, on this year here. We've had a lot of really good rains. Um, so that orchard was severely overcropped. And uh, so we've been thinning Pawnees, started thinning Pawnees as soon as we got back from the Texas show. Um, we said we might have been a little bit late getting some of those Pawnees. Um, kind of what we do. Got to look at a lot of all our trees and we have to make decisions pretty quickly on a tree whether it needs to be cropped in or not kind of our uh our rule of thumb is we look in the center of the canopy about halfway up the tree how fast can we find empty terminals um, if you're looking at a pecan tree especially something that's real showy like a pony all you see is nuts and you need to be cropped in that, that tree um, if you look up there and it's like well there's a blank terminal here's a blank terminal here's a blank terminal we're, we're probably okay um, it's, it's something we, we, we'll, we'll do it. Um, we'll go out there, we'll crop them, we'll start slow, we'll start giving trees a little bit of bump. Uh, and that's actually how we decide when we're going to crop them. We've got a shaker. We'll always we'll start prepping the shakers first of July, making sure everything's ready to go on them for crop thinning. And about once a week, I'll go out and I'll hit a couple of trees with the shaker. See how easy the pecans are coming off. If I've really got a hammer tree, get the nuts off of it. We're a little early. Once we, we can kind of start getting some nuts off with a good bump, then you know it's time. Then that's when we start. Uh, start um, I'm probably the only farmer in my area that actually crop ends. I get a lot of strange looks when they, people see me driving around the shaker in July. A lot of people want to stop and like, what is he doing? I've seen him plant trees and prune trees and spray and spray and spray and spray and spray herbicides and fertilizers and 
And now he's shaking the pecans off of the trees. What is he doing? But it's it's uh, really important to have um, crop that the tree can handle in order to have the kind of quality that you need to have a uh, price in the market you want, plus um, crop for the next year. Um, that's what my father and I we were talking about crop going in. Um, we've seen a lot of times where if you have a really overcropped farm, not only are you going to lose that crop, but you're also going to have a zero the next year. So you, you've effectively, by letting that tree overbear, kind of lost two crops. Uh, we do a lot of custom cleaning for other farmers. They bring me in a trailer. Oh, this is the biggest crop we've ever had. That is until they, you run them through the cleaner and we're having to blow half of them out because there's nothing in them. Then the half they're left with, the grades are terrible. Um, it's, it's, uh, well, what are these pecans worth? Like, well, as soon as I can find somebody who'll give me a bid on this junk, then I'll tell you what they're worth. Um, and that's, that's really the worst case scenario is you have a monster crop and something happens, your irrigation gets off, you don't have enough rain, you run out of water late in the season, and that crop just doesn't fill. Um, that causes a lot of problems, it causes, um, late shuck opening, uh, uneven shuck opening, um, sprouting and just overall poor quality it's 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 uh there's there's an old cowboy around here he's got one of my favorite sayings a little bit of something is still something a whole lot of nothing is still nothing that's the kind of way we look at our crop is we'd rather have um really good really big high quality pecans that are easy to sell and then have a good shot of the crop next year as opposed to well let's roll the dice and see if these trees will fill it out We've done that. We've been burned enough times to, to, to know that if we've got a big crop, we need to go in there and get, get some of these nuts off the trees, especially some of these big varieties like Pawnees. Um, they, they just almost want to give up the crop as soon as you shake it. Um, that's, that's, that's another thing, too, is don't look down. Um, if, if you look down when you're shaking, especially something like a Pawnee, you're, you're, you're going to be sick. Um, my father, he's been around. The whole time we've been crop thinning, he has never sat in a shaker and chuck a tree. And he usually likes to go to the lake when we start crop thinning because he doesn't want to look at it. Um, he always says, you know, we can't put any of these back on the trees. I know, I know, I know, but it'll be worth it. So, um, also, when we're out there crop thinning, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do the best job we can and maybe err a little bit on the light side because our typical, typical protocols, we, we'll go out, we'll shake, we'll thin, and then we'll start over. Um, Go back to the front of the orchard and look again. It's like, okay, don't look at the ground, look back at the tree again. Are we still too heavy? Um, we, we try to do that about a week later, weeks, 10 days later, at the most 10 days. Um, try to get started as early as we can the crop thinning process. That way, we've got this option to do a second shake if we really need it. And I've done that on a lot of farms. I've got a dry land farm that's full of Mohawks, and I, I, I'll double shake it almost every year. But almost every year for the last 10 years, that orchard has had a set of big crop. So I think it's because I'm taking so much off. My, my quality is great. It's like Mohawk's kind of an ugly variety. I wish that orchard didn't have them in there, but they're there. So um, their, their quality is good enough to sell, and uh, they're having a big crop the next year. Um, so. Oh, so we've actually had... Uh, some uh, we had some Lakota trees, eight year old Lakota trees last year made their first crop. They made 1400 pounds the acre last year on some eight year old trees. It was unbelievable. They had more nuts than leaves. Well, quality was pretty poor on them. Then we never thinned a tree that was that young. We should have. Um, then, of course, over this uh, last winter, we had that crazy freeze. And I've got three varieties in orchard I've got Pawnee, Dakota, and Lakota. Dakota's by far took it the worst. We probably lost five to 10% of the trees, an eight-year-old tree was dead. Um, and I, I know it's because they were so crop stressed. So they actually, that, that crazy thing about Lakota, it actually came back with a crop again this year. We went in and we, we've already planted it. So um, we'll start off with, with bigger varieties, early varieties, Pawnee and Kansas, of course. Um, about time we wrap up those, we're moving into some of the other varieties like Cheyenne. Cheyenne's a, a difficult variety to thin because if you drive by the tree a lot of times it doesn't look like it has a crop on it because Pawnee is real showy they're going to put those, those big light green nuts with those contrasting dark green leaves out for everybody to see 
Cheyennes, they're, they're hiding their crop. They don't want to let anybody see it. They're in behind leaves. And they usually have a little bit of secondary growth that hides it even worse. Sometimes you don't know you have a giant Cheyenne crop until you actually go out there and start cropping. And say, oh my gosh, what happened? I didn't know this thing had that big of a crop on it. Uh, so we, we do crop thin variety to variety. We have a little bit of Wichita's here. I feel like the Wichita's go just a little bit heavier than we would anything else because of the amount of leaves on them. And that's kind of what that variety does. Is it, it'll do a pretty good job filling it out. But um, if, if we let a Wichita just really overload too, we'll have a lot of problems with sprouts. And uh, it, that's that's the most aggravating thing uh, for, for us is sprouts and crop. If we let it overcrop. Because you almost can't inspect it out, you can't blow it out, you can't pull it off, and a little bit of sprout. Sometimes you can't even see it, but you, once you start showing it out and run samples, you see some embryo growth. That's of course got to come out of that grade, so you're just you're costing yourself money the whole time. So, um, like I said, we've been crop thinning, and we definitely uh, we're big believers in it. Um, we'd rather have a really good crop. Uh, Big junky one, and uh, we've been burned by leaving cons on trees, so we're gonna continue to do it. So you have a you have a mono boom kind of, of shaker. It's a little bit different than like the video that I posted sent out to the class. We have uh, a three point shaker that hooks to the trunk. So having that that different type of of shaker allows you to do things a little bit differently. Right. Yeah, we've got, with, uh, you know, with the, uh, the monoboom shaker, we're looking up into the canopy and actually we'll try to, we'll try to spot, you know, maybe one limb, three or four clusters in the tree and we'll give it a pretty good bump and, and see how many of those are still on the tree. Um, it also, <laughs> the monobooms, the new ones are handy because you can actually dial a shake in. So. Um, that's what I did. I'll go in and, and shake her, set it up. I'll set the RPMs. I'll set the duration. And so I can turn one of my employees loose with that machine. They hit a button, it clamps, it throttles up, it shakes, and let's go. Um, I will say, though, like uh, first Pawnee Orchard, we started thinning this year. We started thinning on about a Thursday. The orchard broke up into three sections. By the time we got to the third section, the middle of the next week, I had to dial it way back. Because those Pawnees, like we're talking about how fast they expand, mm -hmm. it was incredible how much more we were taking off you know, each day. Yeah. So it's, it's important to kind of adjust and really look and pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah. And if you're, if you're using a trunk shaker, you really need a, a, another person to be your spotter. So if we're on a monoboom, you can be doing a little bit more careful adjustment yourself. But uh, what about looking at the bottom of the canopy? What what do you think there is? What do you think on where you're looking in the canopy of the tree? You know, when you're especially with all shakers, especially those monobooms. I mean, when you grab the trunk, it's it's like a whip. So mm -hmm. most of you're not getting the, as much shake at the bottom as you are at the top. So most of the cons that are coming off this tree are coming off the top. So that's mm -hmm. why we're trying to focus halfway up that canopy because to get the pecans, I mean, you can just see it once the pecans are. Um, open once shuck splits already happened when we green shake all the pecans are sitting on top all the pecans that are left are still on the bottom so when we have to come back our second time over harvest um, after a freeze and after the leaves off all those pecans are on the bottom of, of that tree because that's not getting the shake right off pathways that's why we, we don't even look at the bottom it's, it's always and, you, and with a big leaf load it also kind of dampens that shake as well so um, it's a little bit different type of shake than you're going to be doing at harvest time um, when you may have had a freeze and lost some of those leaves. So the adjustment is a, is a big part. So Jake, you, um, you talked about on one orchard, you've had a really good crop for, for several years. So that, that crop load thinning, it allows those trees to kind of get out of that alternate bearing uh, kind of tendency. So when they're filling the crop right now, they're thinking about, they're, they're preparing for the crop next season. So if they're overcrowded during that ripening time, they have a whole bunch, they're not able to, to allow for the crop next year. So you've noticed that on yours, that they have a consistent bearing? Oh yeah, this, the, I've got one 30 acre orchard that's got, and it's dry land. There's no irrigation on it. It's got some really good sandy soils. 
Um, it's got Mohawk, Cheyenne, and Wichita's. A little bit of Kiowa. And I go in and I crop them the whole thing every year because I don't have any irrigation that I can count on up there. Um, I'll probably thin it down to about a third of a crop. That's kind of the goal up there is to have about 33% of the terminals have a crop on it. And my quality, the joke with my father is, is we need to start tearing our irrigation systems out because these are bigger Cheyennes, better Cheyennes than we're growing in the irrigated setting. Um, but it, it, it's all because of the crop thinning because I'm going up there. Right. Now, Mohawk's one of those Mohawk's one of those varieties that's probably the worst about alternate bearing and not filling properly and if having that cold damage when they are overcropped. So uh, that's surprising that you can get a really good consistent crop using dry land. But but normally we think of about um, maybe fifty to sixty percent of a crop when we're you know when we're irrigating and everything. But on that dry land, I can see where a less uh, maybe a thirty three percent would be better better options. So that's good. Interesting. So um, so on your Lakota trees, I, I've heard the similar things from around the state that people say they, they like to load up really early, um, really early precocious bearing, uh, lots of nuts early, early on. But if they get some cold uh, after that heavy crop, they're going to have some cold injury. So that's one thing I you know, people really need to be watching and, and doing crop load, especially on Lakota, I think. Yeah, I was, uh, when, when, when we had bud break and my Lakota started not coming out, I, I was uh, pretty concerned. I got, I got called Charlie Graham and he came over and was like, what, what has happened with these, why, why are all these trees dead? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, he knew right away. He was like, well, that's, if the crop yeah. you tell me they had on them, I see exactly why. Yeah. They will bear themselves to death. And, there's no way that that variety should have had a crop on it this year. It, it, it was overcropped again, the trees that live. So um, that's going to be something on that variety where we're going to have to just yeah. really pay attention, really crop that. And, and your, your observation, your instructions on don't look at the ground is so important because <laughs> Like, like your dad, he just leaves the country. Um, so many people have trouble thinning enough. And, yeah. and so once they see those nuts falling, it's like they want to stop all of a sudden. But they really need to keep their eye up into that tree. Uh, but, but we see that with everyone. It's so difficult. It, it goes against, you know, human nature. You're, you're growing nuts. Why are you knocking them off the, on the ground? But it actually is, is so helpful. And, uh, and I have a lot of people ask, you know, do you do anything with those nuts once you shake them off on, on the ground? Yeah, no, it's, they'll dry up into little black shriveled yep. pecans in a few days and some Texas heat, so they're, they're gone pretty quick. We'll pick them up with the harvester and they blow right out the first aspirator, so. Yep, it's mostly water at this time of the year, so they yeah. dry up really easily. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's that is a, a thing. Now, if if someone's doing this in the in a yard tree, they can still get out there with a frailing pole or something and knock off some of the crop if they have too much. But oh, yeah. uh, just so they can have a more consistent production, better nuts. But yeah. you know, in your situation where you have two nut houses, I don't, I don't know what you prefer your your retail stores. Oh, you got retail stores, um, you know, that uh, you, you need to have consistent something to sell and high quality. So it is extremely important um, to be able to provide the product each year and not rely on just what um, what nature is going to give you. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's always easy. It's good pecans and good cattle are always easy. Um, there's a lot of times we've seen it with some of our crops, some of our, our, our cooperators that we do a lot of custom cleaning for. Those grades aren't up where they need to be. Uh, it's hard for me to call a showing company and say, I've got a load, you know, it's on these that are going to yield 48%. They don't want to hear about it. That's, that's not where they don't care what the price is on it. It's just not going to be worth their time. Right. So it's, it's always better to have really high quality. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can go in there and do it. So. Yeah. Well, does anybody have a question for for Jake? Any questions for Jake from the audience? You can either put it in the chat or unmute. If you think of something later, you're always um, encouraged to go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll catch you up at the at the end. Well, Jake, anything else that you want to add for? Um. 
popped off my head. It just... Okay. Well, I appreciate you um, showing up today. I know it, it means a lot to hear it coming from the, the grower, the professional that does this full time and, um, and seeing how important it is. And like you said, you know, Dr. Mike Smith is, is the one that did that first research um, in the country and it's used pretty much everywhere now. So that's pretty exciting. And we had a grower, um, Gordon Couch from Luther, Oklahoma. And oh, yeah. he said, he said, well, you thin peaches and apples. Why don't you thin up a pecan tree? Oh, yeah. And so that's where we started doing research was at Gordon Couch's orchard there in Luther, right on Highway 66 and spent hours and hours in bucket trucks up in the top of trees, removing nuts. Um, but, uh, but it really works and it's really, uh, something that, that people really need to pay attention to and, um, and try to get that consistent production, high quality, consistent production. So appreciate you being here and, um, thanks for, for pre providing your expertise. And, um, again, we, we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, our uh, last speaker for the day is, uh, is our Extension Irrigation Specialist in Biosystems and Ag Engineering. We have uh, Sala Taglevan, and he is going to talk about irrigation, um, irrigation scheduling and how to monitor for, um, for how you need to um, irrigate your crop at this time of the year. So. Sala, I think I made you a co-host. You should be able to um, share your screen. Yep. All right. Good to see you. Hey. Yeah, same here. Uh, good discussion. Uh, I, I uh, was uh, learning a lot, especially the parts that you guys were talking about, dry land versus irrigated, because that's something I, I, I work on. So uh, very good. I appreciate the good discussion. Um, so... Um, Guess you guys are seeing the share the screen now, and and hopefully the the presenter view. Um, so it's good, yeah. It's okay, good. okay, very good. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, pecan irrigation, and and uh, for those of you who attended the uh, pecan management course on Tuesday, uh, a lot of the slides are similar, but I changed the slides a little bit, so so it's not the exact same thing. Uh, but I apologize if you've already seen this or, or parts of this. So uh, why irrigation? Well, mature pecan trees could require substantial amounts of water. And uh, you know, I've, I've heard different numbers, I've estimated different numbers, but it could be in um, thousands of gallons per acre uh, per day during the peak of the growing season. Um, so that sometimes, rain enough, uh, rain, rain itself is not enough to, uh, re to supply the entire amount of water that's used by pecan trees. So we need to, we need to provide uh, that additional water. Now, I saw a couple of interesting photos that I um, stole here. So these are from Not Dynasty. And um, this gentleman here has a uh, blog post and has a YouTube uh, channel as well. And here in the photos, he was showing uh, two pecan trees, same variety, same age, planted six years ago. The one on the left is not irrigated. The one on the right is irrigated. And you can compare the sizes. I think he is in Florida uh, because he is pronouncing it uh, pecan. So, um, but, um, but, but this, this shows you the difference between the uh, irrigated versus non-irrigated. Okay, so... Uh, thinking about irrigation, there are three important factors to consider. Uh, number one is the irrigation system. If you don't have an irrigation system, you want to uh, start one, in, invest in one. Uh, you need to know about it. Or if you already have one, uh, thinking about maintenance or improving the efficiency of the system, uh, soil type, and pecan water use, that, which is the irrigation requirement. Now with irrigation systems, there are three main types, the gravity system, if they're also called flood or, or surface irrigation. I know they're very common in New Mexico. A lot of pecan orchards there are, are flood irrigated. Uh, there's a sprinkler method and our pecan orchards uh, at the Cimarron Valley Research Station are sprinkler irrigated. 
And then drip uh, irrigation, it's also called micro or localized because we're not uh, wetting the entire area, entire soil surface. It, it's a very limited application of water. So that's, that's why it's sometimes called localized. Now with gravity irrigation, as, as the name implies, uh, water moves, uh, flows with the, uh, with the force of gravity. Uh, usually if, if there's any pressure uh, applied, is to get water to the application point, but uh, at that point, water is released through borders or basins, and it, it just flows over the soil surface and floods the field. So this photo is from U.S. Geological Survey. They took it, one of the orchards in uh, New Mexico, uh, Rio Grande project they had there. It shows you mature orchards and flood irrigation. With flood irrigation, you typically are looking at smallest uh, initial cost, uh, and I said typically in parentheses because if you need to grade, do some uh, land grading, then that adds to the cost. But but typically it has the smallest initial cost of all irrigation system. It's also typically the least intensive in uh, maintenance in terms of maintenance requirement. Um, with uh, it, with row crops, if there are like siphon tubes that 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 may need some maintenance and some labor, which is my next point. But typically with border or basin and orchards, it's less maintenance, not much maintenance and not much labor uh, to get irrigations done. Uh, but also it's the least amenable to implementing smart control. So if you wanna be able to control the irrigation, as you guys may know that uh, with, with uh, some of the other crops uh, nowadays and some of the other irrigation systems, you can have smart control panels and you can have uh, cell phone apps where you can see um, the different zones and you can decide which zone would start irrigating at what time and for how much. You can control all of that from a cell phone or a laptop computer. Um, and you can also start bringing in information from sensors or satellite imagery and make more decisions. So if you wanna do things like that, which I call smart control precision irrigation, then it's, it's not impossible, but it's more difficult with flood irrigation. And it's also most effective for controlling soil salinity. So if salinity is an issue, because we apply water in large amounts and it covers the entire surface or most of the surface of the orchard, then uh, these systems are most effective in leaching salts below the root zone and controlling that. Uh, sprinkler uh, irrigation, as the name implies, uh, it involves uh, different types of sprinklers or many types out there. Uh, photos here are from a company called, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's called Nandan Jane. I think it's an Israeli company. Um, and this is a project they had in Mexico. So this was a mature developed orchard. So you see that uh, the, the, um, the, the pipes are buried and they, are, they have this a sprinkler system. Sometimes for these mature orchards, it's easier to do a sprinkler than drip because drip needs to be near the trees. And if it's subsurface drip, it could cause some damages. But this is established orchard. So they wanted to do uh, sprinkler and you see they've also buried all the pipes so it's not causing any issues for the movement of machinery and the and across the orchard. With the sprinkler systems uh, you have some initial cost it's more than gravity or flood systems obviously but less than drip. Uh, you have some maintenance requirement uh, with the sprinkler heads with the pipes there could be leaks there could be breaks there could be other things uh, going on so there's some maintenance they're less labor intensive compared to flood irrigation. Um, we talked about a smart control. So these are a little bit easier if you have different zones, you can have uh, automatic valves uh, on zones and then open or close those valves and uh, manage different zones however you want. Um, so they're a little bit more amenable to a uh, smart control. And they're somewhat effective for controlling salinity depending on sprinklers, the vetting, the vetted radius and the amount of water that's being applied, but they're obviously more effective in leaching salts than a drip system. Uh, with a drip system, uh, there are different types. So this graphic from uh, company Toro does a really good job. You see that there are, uh, there are some trees uh, on this side of the, the graphic. You see they have double lines here 
on the ground, uh, drip lines, uh, could be drip tapes for some row crops, and we could also have subsurface drip. Uh, so in this case, drip tapes are buried like 12, 18 inches or, or maybe even more than that below the soil surface. Uh, there's always filtration involved, something to keep in mind because those drippers are super, super tiny. So we need to make sure that we do a really good job of filtration. So with this drip irrigation, it, it usually requires the largest initial cost uh, because you're running all those drip lines uh, across the orchard. There's filtration going on. There's other things in, uh, that are required. So the initial cost is, is larger. And because that initial cost is largest, you typically need these drip systems to uh, work properly for 20 to 30 years to be able to get the return in investment. Shorter than that, it may not be, depending on the drip type, but they may not be uh, cost effective if, if you're not looking at that, that horizon. Um, they require the most intensive maintenance uh, to fix the leaks, to inject chlorine and acid, to prevent growth of biological stuff and chemicals and, and uh, precipitation of those chemicals. Um, they, they require flushing. Uh, they're probably the least labor intensive um, and they are the most amenable to smart control and, and precision irrigation. Depending on how much money you want to spend, I've seen drip systems in, in wind yards where you could uh, literally control every single emitter. Obviously, there's an there's a, uh, increased cost to that, but, but you could do that. And they're least effective for controlling salinity because uh, only a small part of the uh, orchard or the root zone receives water. The amounts that we apply are small. Usually, if they're managed properly, no deep percolation is generated. The water that's applied stays in the root zone. That water evaporates and leaves all the salts behind. And if you have a salinity problem to begin with, uh, it's, it's uh, not going to help unless you have good uh, like winter rainfall that can take care of the salinity. Now, with pecan water use, uh, you may hear this term evapotranspiration. It, it's just evaporation plus, tra plus transpiration. The water that's directly evaporated, the water that goes through the plant, uh, you see the combination uh, being uh, termed as evapotranspiration. It depends on weather variables. It depends on plant characteristics. Uh, obviously, uh, if you have a windy day, uh, that water use, that evapotranspiration would be higher because of the wind. If relative humidity is low, it's a really dry uh, day that water use will be uh, higher. If the air temperature is high, it's a really hot day. Again, that evapotranspiration will be higher. So as you can imagine, it changes from day to day, from hour to hour, uh, something to keep an eye. In Oklahoma, we have Oklahoma Mesonet. Uh, they have about 120 weather stations that cover the entire state. We can get evapotranspiration data from Oklahoma Mesonet. Here I'm showing the map of average ET for the month of June. And this is the average of uh, years 2006 to 2020. And you can see where you are in the state and you can uh, read the numbers like uh, six, maybe uh, from if you look from at the eastern border from about six inches for the whole month of June uh, to over here, north, uh, west, uh, eight and nine, and maybe even more inches. I don't know if we have any pecan orchards here in Panhandle, but uh, but anyway, you can see that range uh, of differences for a mature orchard uh, from six to about nine inches for the month of June. Uh, the same thing uh, pretty much for the month of July, and you also see the month of August here. So if you get enough rain to replenish uh, this uh, trans transpired water, this used up water, that, that's, that's great. But if not, if the timing is not good, then you need some irrigation system. Um, so plant characteristics obviously impact that a water use growth stage variety, plant population. So if you have a, a, a dense orchard uh, compared to a, an orchard that's, I don't know, maybe only 20% ground cover, they obviously have different water requirements, something to keep in mind. And soil type is another thing to pay attention to. Uh, they, the soil is important because water movement is in, in the soil is controlled by soil type. Uh, soil porosity impacts how much water we can hold in the soil. So that's basically the size of this tank, this reservoir. Um, and with the water movement, 
the example that I always use is the sandy, sandy loam soil, really coarse, and the clay loam soil, which has a fine texture. And uh, if, if this experiment was done in, in a way that they applied water here at the surface, this is soil surface zero, and we're going below this, uh, the surface here down to 72 inches, uh, water was applied here, and they looked at that water movement, waterfront in the root zone. And if you look at the 24 hours, which is the blue shade here with the sandy soil, you see that uh, after a day, it has reached 72 inches below uh, soil surface, and it's gone uh, sidewise about 12 inches on either side of that water application point. So it's, it's very narrow and it's deep. With the clay uh, loam soil, 24 hour, it's this orange color, and you see it's about uh, as half as deep, uh, only 36 inches, uh, but it's much wider. It's gone 30 inches to the sides. So that really uh, should uh, be something that you can use when you decide about how much water to apply in each irrigation with your soil type. If you have a sandy soil and you run irrigation for too long, let's say in this case, you run it for like I don't know, more than 24 hours, then you're gonna get water going below 72 inches. Now, if you want that, then good. But if not, you have to just keep that in mind that these are very different shapes. And with porosity, with sandy soil, we have a smaller porosity. So sandier soils can hold less water. And if you have a sandy soil, you have to irrigate more frequently than if you have a clay soil. Clay soils have more porosity, more space for water uh, to be stored. Uh, so that's uh, something uh, to keep in mind. Maybe that irrigation interval could be a little bit uh, longer for clay soil than for sandy soil. So efficient irrigation, uh, you can uh, think of it as uh, the series of glasses, you want to start irrigations before the glass is empty, before the soil is too dry, and you want to stop irrigation before the soil, uh, all, all those pores, the voids are, are full. Uh, if you apply more water, the voids are, are full and you continue irrigating, you're going to lose water. And a lot of times that uh, lost water is in terms of deep percolation. We don't see it. Uh, but it's happening. So that's why it's important uh, if you want to manage the pumping cost, the energy cost, uh, if you want to uh, keep all the uh, critical nutrients in the root zone, you want to make sure that you're not causing too much deep percolation. Um, and, and that's something that uh, you have to keep in mind with the efficient irrigation. Uh, there are a lot of sensors out in the market uh, that you can use if you want to uh, do an efficient irrigation. Uh, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss those. So I'm going to stop here and um, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Hey, Salah, this is Ron Hollis. Uh, can you, can you uh, say what deep percolation is again? That went past me. Yeah, so deep percolation happens when water moves below the bottom of the root zone. Okay, okay. So if you have that, the main challenge is all the nutrients that are applied are most of them are soluble in water. So that water is going to carry all the nutrients below the root zone. If there, if there are no roots found there to extract them, then they're basically lost. That was clear. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I should have defined it. Do we have any other questions? I think that was really good information. I was say, do you have any data on uh, how efficient underground drip is versus sprinklers? Um, not, not on, yeah, not on pecans, but I've seen with some of the row crops, uh, a lot of the differences at the beginning of the season with those row crops, when you don't have a closed canopy, but they have a little bit different, uh, canopy development than, than pecans, because with pecans, we have green ups with the row crops. It's a little bit different, but, but typically when you have exposed soil, you'll have more evaporation. Uh, when you have a closed canopy, you don't get the, the, the sun uh, radiation going all the way down to the soil surface. You typically have a smaller amount of, of direct evaporation. But you also have to think, of, like if you're comparing a sprinkler with drip, you, can also, you, you should also keep in mind all the vetted area and the frequency of the irrigation applications. The more frequent you apply water, you, the, the more frequent those vegetate, if, if, like if you have grasses or other stuff at the, at the uh, uh, orchard floor. Um, so they're, the more frequently they're gonna get wet and stay wet, 
and that's going to cause more evaporation. With subsurface drip, that surface evaporation is pretty much entirely eliminated uh, unless you want to uh, make sure that the water reaches the soil surface, which and in case of pecan, I don't know why people would want that. In case of row crops, you want to help with germination, but uh, you, you can have them deep enough that there's essentially no evaporation. And that, that can help with controlling weeds too. Any other questions? Uh, there's a question in the chat. It says, will night irrigation create more pressure on scab or irrigate till water needs are met? Night irrigation? I, I, I don't know about that and the effect uh, on scabs. But what I would say is um, my, my recommendation is to try to wait as long as possible. And, and that's why in a lot of the studies we do, we use sensors or we use apps that are available to estimate how long we can wait and then wait as long as possible uh, before the next irrigation. Uh, and that's to uh, take advantage of the full uh, reservoir capacity of the soil and make sure that the water that's applied gets stored there and it's available for the roots to use later. As it was mentioned earlier, if, if you apply too frequently before the water is needed, uh, it may be nothing wrong, no direct impact as far as water is stressed, but then that evaporation component is just going to be larger and more of that water will be lost uh, through evaporation. Mike, did that answer your question? I know that this past season, we've had so much humidity and dew that, I mean, our orchards, they didn't dry out until late afternoon anyway, a lot of the days. But, um, but anytime you're adding water spray, uh, if you're using sprinklers, it's going to be increasing the humidity in, in that orchard area. So your scab uh, pressure could be elevated. But I don't know. On other crops, they don't really like you to irrigate like in the evening because it's going to take longer to dry out. But I know in our orchard, it's pretty much we have to keep it on 24 hours in some areas just to be able to rotate through the, the orchard through the different zones. So it may, you know, we may just have to do that to be able to get everything irrigated enough. But that's a good question, Mike. Any other questions for Sala? I, I always think it's so important to make sure that you know about your soils to be able to design your irrigation system and, and, and also your frequency and amount of water um, to your soil type because it, it makes such a difference. Uh, at the station, we have such sandy soils. In some places when we have, uh, we had underground drip, I, I doubt that we really used much of that water because it went straight through deep percolation like you were talking about. And um, so it's, it can be an issue. So make sure that you're making sure those things are lining up together. And those, those systems that Sala talked about, um, you know, he posted his, his information there for contact. But if you have questions about um, monitoring your orchard, uh, he'll be a great resource. And if you didn't get his information, you're always welcome to email me and I can share his information as well. So thank you so much, Saul, for, for um, doing that presentation. And thanks, Jake. Um, appreciate you uh, joining us today, too. And we've got um, a small but great crowd today. And just want to remind you that September 10th is our next class. I'm not sure of the topics just yet, but it will be something timely and uh, something that you need to be thinking about for that time of the season. And, um, and be sure and look for information about our field day on September 23rd in the, the Ada area. So if you have questions in between now and then you're welcome to contact me um, and I can help you or get you in touch with, with the people that are, are appropriate for your questions. But thank you so much for joining us today and um, we will see you next month. So see you later. Bye-bye, thank you.